Okay, I'm going to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to Gardening Green Expo 2023. Um, it's sponsored by the NSRWA, the WaterSmart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Zoom for anybody that hasn't used it before. Down in the bottom, uh, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see something called chat. And if you open that up, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. And then when we get to the end, I'll read them to our speaker and she can answer those questions. Um, and once again, this will be uh, videotaped. So we will have a recording of it in case anybody misses it or wants to watch it again. Um, so I would like to introduce Susan Lee Anthony. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, this slideshow uh, is going to be about um, the drought resistant yard, and I'm going to try to help you figure out how to create, whoops, beautiful spaces in your yard using native and non-native plants, doing it with less water. I have to get used to these buttons here. Um, so... I just want to see, I think there should be an, okay, all right, good. Um, so why, when, and how to water? And these are all important things. Um, people, honestly, so many people think they know how to water and they, and, and, and they really could use some help. So all newly planted things do need ample watering to establish a strong root system. Um, planting this spring is still the better time unless you get a nice moist, uh, fall. Um, but as far as, you know, going forward through the season um, and, and getting a lot of cool plants in the beginning of the season, um, spring is a time because we usually don't have any um, terrible drought situation, thank God, yet um, at that time of year. And watering early in the day is best because um, of evaporation. Um, and you don't want to do it at the end of the day because um, then you're getting your leaves wet and that uh, promotes um, uh, fungus and that kind of thing and diseases. Um, and deep, whoops, I don't know why that keeps happening. Deep watering is important too. Um, uh, I see people with these um, sprinkler systems and irrigation and they're on for very short periods of time. And there, it's every day. So what it's doing is it's getting your roots to establish only at the top of the soil line, um, at the very top layer. And then when it's dry, they don't have roots that are deep. So deep watering less often. Um, and um, again, when it's a newly planted thing, you just gotta keep an eye on things. Um, so different soil types, of course, need different amounts of water. Um, if you've got dry, gritty, fast draining soil, um, then, you know, without a lot of um, um, additional organic matter and so forth, um, it's going to run through a lot faster. Um, uh, be sure to pay attention to trees. I've noticed that, um, you know, the trees actually can start to get very stressed out after long periods of drought. And if we lose our trees, that's a problem. You know, a shrub, a perennial and annual can be replaced relatively easily, um, not so much with trees, not only expense, but the time it takes to grow them. Um, so you want to make sure that you've um, given your trees ample water, probably first and foremost. Um, ericaceous plants like rhodes, azaleas, mountain laurel, those kinds of things are shallow rooted to begin with, and they cannot be allowed to dry out Again, I, I noticed at the end of um, the season last year, a lot of roadies that were very stressed out or dying or had big branches all brown. So um, the or organic matter and mulch to improve the soils and help retain moisture is a good idea if the plants are the type of plants that want that. Um, and grouping plants with similar needs together um, is also a good strategy. Um, so nothing is drought proof, all right? There's just not gonna happen um, around here um, with the kinds of plants we have. 
Um, so everything does need some water and you just have to stay on top of it. Um, but I've tried to collect plants here that are beautiful and don't look like you live in Arizona and um, uh, can, can deal with some amount of, of drought situation. Um, in situate, we have terrible restrictions. I mean, just really tough, um, you know, to the point where they're like, okay, you can take your watering can out and I've got 16 beds of perennial shrubs and trees. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I, I have to, and I go out with my watering cans or jugs that we fill up in the house. And, and um, I deal with what looks like it's incredibly stressed out and needs water. So there we go. So um, this is the situate reservoir folks um, uh, at its pretty much worse. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a scary site. I know those of us living here drive by it and, and kind of shudder, um, but we have limited water and, um, of course, building and, um, population increase and all that, um, really taxes our water system. But, you know, we, a lot of us want to grow things, um, and be it for gardens of pleasure or for food, and we should be able to. So, so we have to conserve water um, during these times. Um, I've observed over the many years that I've been doing um, plants and working for uh, uh, clients and in my own garden, I've noticed, um, especially the last few years where we've had a lot of, you know, rough, rough drought years, um, you know, and restrictions, what, what does better than, you know, something else? And it's been somewhat surprising. Um, so you'll see. Um, but you know, I don't want to. I don't want it to look like we live in Arizona. We don't have to do that, okay? Um, and just remember, things need to be watered. This isn't, a, you know, you walk, plant it, and walk away thing. All right. Um, should probably leave that alone because it keeps. Every time I touch my mouse, it does that. Okay. So. Here are a few New England natives. Um, at the top is, on the right is what we all grew up calling aster. And we don't call it that anymore, or we're not supposed to. It's Symphiotrichon nova angliae. Um, and it's a mouthful. And, um, but it's one of those keystone plants that we really should have in our yards for um, the sake of pollinators, along with um, goldenrod, and there's a lot of different types of goldenrod that are native to our area. Um, that's called solidago. Um, and of course, oaks are also, and I believe um, some of the salix, but those need moisture. Um, those would be the, the willows. Um, so down in the um, left is Campanula rotundifolia. Um, it is a bellflower. It is native. Um, you don't really see it around situate, but it's native to New England. Um, and um, I remember many years ago when my husband and I used to camp um, driving around in, um, you know, the Kankamangas or someplace and seeing a patch of that growing out of a crevice in a rock. So it is, um, it's a tough plant um, and it's very, very pretty, long blooming. And then we have the red oak on the bottom and there are a lot of native oaks. And of course we all know, and I think we're gonna see Doug Tallamy um, touts the um, uh, wonders of the oaks in terms of um, their ability to uh, host hundreds of different kinds of important pollinators. So um, again, here's another oak, the burr oak. Um, I love, the the uh, acorn way over on the left it just cracks me up it just looks like i don't know dr seuss character or something and um it is the burr oak and then the to the right of that um is the burr oak a large oak tree um eastern red cedar which we all see around here is the next juniperus virginiana it's tolerant of, of heat and drought and salt and a lot of different kinds of soils um and, um, you know, that's the one with the beautiful juniper berries. Um, way over on the right is the sassafras. 
and I think most of us would be familiar with this tree. Um, they're they're fairly prolific in our area with in what's left of our woods, and um, I knew this as a child as the mitten tree because you can see one of the leaves there. Not all of them. Some of them are just you know sort of oval and pointed. Some of them have the three um, different parts to it, and some of them just have a mitten with a thumb, and so the mitten tree. Um, here are some native New England shrubs, and all of these are fragrant. Um, I Silly me, I didn't put in the common names, but I will. The, the um, Mirica, Mirica Pennsylvanica up at the top left is, um, that's bayberry. And um, we do see that, um, you know, locally. Um, very, very aromatic plant gets the gray, gray uh, berries or fruits. Um, and um, it's a tough plant. Um, you see it sometimes right on the side of the road or um, take it'll take not so great soil too. Um, and the top right is Prunus maritima. And I'm trying to think of the name of that plant. Um, I meant to figure that out. I, I do know what it is. I just am blanking. Um, you make jam out of them. Uh, somebody looked that up for me. Um, I'm just drawing a blank. I apologize. Um, it may come to me. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about it. The um, bottom left is uh, Rosa Virginiana. And I have three of those out in the front of my stone wall. And, and they are tough. They, they bloom. They get rose hips. Um, and even though it says Virginia, and it doesn't mean that it just grows in Virginia. Um, Susan, they, one of yeah. our, actually a couple of our um, attendees have said beach plum. Beach plum. Thank you. Jeez. Thank you. I don't know, you know, just old, old person brain. Thank you. I knew that. I just couldn't come up with it. Um, anyway, beach plum. Um, and it does make a mighty good jam. Um, so that's the rose. And then way over on the right is called sweet fern or Comptonia peregrina. And um, that also, you know, um, tough plant, aromatic, um, interesting sort of squiggly looking leaves. And um, it's a, it's definitely that and the bayberry are, are plants out of my childhood and bring back memories when I um, get their scent. So um, these are all native to our area. Um, here's witch hazels. The top one, Hemimalis ovalis, is not a native, but I had to show you the gorgeous color on that one. Um, uh, the bottom one is the native one, and if you've been walking in woods in our area um, at the right time of year, which is pretty much now, um, and even about a month ago, um, they're in bloom for a long time, and they are um, native and um, a very nice tree to have, um, sort of between a tree and a shrub. Um, I belong to the Rock Garden Society and I was recently at a meeting and someone brought in um, four or five different um, types of um, witch hazel in every color of the rainbow. So whether you're doing a native or um, a cultivar, they are all um, relatively drought tolerant and good early pollinators, the um, native too. Um, Cianathus americanus, I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, New Jersey tea um, just does not get huge, this plant. Um, and um, it's a good pollinator plant, that's for sure. And it's fragrant. And the reason they call it New Jersey tea or tea is because it dates back to colonial times um, and, and the bee bombs also were a plant they used because they weren't buying tea from, from, the, um, uh, from the British and had to find other plants to use. And this was one of them, they called them Liberty Teas. Um, so we're into perennials, um, native New England perennials now. And the top one, um, most people I would think would be familiar with um, Asclepias tuberosa or butterfly weed or pleurisy root. Um, 
this plant comes up quite late in the season. So it's good to know where you've planted it or you're liable to, you know, stick something on top of it um, and disrupt the roots. So know where it is in your garden. It'll grow by the seashore. Um, it really kind of likes not great soil, you know, do fine without it, um, quite drought tolerant. And of course it's the um, uh, host plant for the monarch. So very important plant to have. I'm not putting in the um, Asclepias syriaca, you know, the, the common milkweed. It can be quite invasive, um, but if you've got some out in a patch in a, in a field, by all means, let it go wild. But um, it's not something you want in your perennial beds, um, if you know what I mean, because it'll, it's hard to get rid of. Uh, bottom left is Aquilegia canadensis. Um, wild columbine. I have a real penchant for um, all the columbines and um, it's a good um, uh, plant for pollinators, uh, hummingbirds, anything with a long tongue uh, can get in there. Um, and um, it is short-lived, but it will recede if it likes where it is. Uh, Christmas fern down on the right, Polystichum acrostichoides. Um, I remember these from my childhood. Um, I think I've said in another um, talk that they call it Christmas fern for what I know of is two reasons. One is that it's quite evergreen. And also if you look at the individual leaves um, on each um, frond, I guess you call it, um, they, they have like a little shape, almost like a Christmas stocking. So that's where that comes from, I've been told. Um, let's see. Okay, we come to um, a, some of the um, beard tongues, the penstemons. Uh, the top one is penstemon digitalis. Um, it's lighter, it's more white, um, very, very pretty plant. Good uh, penstemons are excellent pollinator plants. Um, the bottom left is wild lupin. And um, I remember my mother bringing me back seed from, from Maine. And if you drive up, you know, north especially um, at the right time of year, um, you, you will see quite a few of these. And, I, and it always um, reminds me too of the book, Miss Rumpheus. Um, those of you with kids um, may know it. It's been around for a while. She was this little old lady, I think, supposed to be Maine, and she goes around sprinkling seeds of, of the wild lupin everywhere. Um, it's a nice story. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer, and it's uh, loved by several moth species. Um, the bottom right one is hairy beard tongue, penstemon hirsutus. And if you see that hirsutus on anything, or tomentose, it usually means hairy. Um, uh, like her suit. Um, so that's another one, very soft, pretty shade of pink. Um, here's some ground covers, native ground covers. And just don't even think that I'm covering every plant. There's so many more. I just, you know, I would have had 4,000 slides, but these are ones I chose. The bearberry or Arctostaphylus uva ursi is um, a great um, uh, native ground cover. Um, it's, um, it's uh, I believe it's, um, uh, you know, get, keeps its leaves all, all season um, and evergreen and does get red berries. And it's, um, it's really great in sort of a woodlandy, foresty kind of area. Um, the foam flower or Tiarella cordifolia over on the right top is a lovely plant. There are many cultivars of this um, that get more pink on the blooms, um, more interesting leaves. Um, they also have um, paired it up um, with um, uh, heucheras so that there's a plant called heucherella and all, they're all good in dry areas because the Eucharist are as well. Um, the Fregaria virginiana, the wild strawberry down on the left 
bottom. I think most of us have probably seen this plant, um, loves it in kind of field situation. Um, and um, it, it's a, a great little plant. And plus you get little strawberries on it if the birds don't get them first. Um, the plantain pussy toes over on the right bottom, Antenaria plantaginifolia um, is a great dry ground cover native, um, gets kind of a soft, dusty pink tone to the blossoms um, and also a good pollinator. Just about all these natives are gonna be great pollinator plants for our local pollinators, which is of course very important. Um, here's a few of the native grasses for New England. Um, the top is big blue stem Andropogon gerardii. And um, that's it later in the season. You can see there's goldenrod and Rudbeckia and so forth in this field. And it looks great with some of these, those kinds of plants um, with asters and um, composite plants, um, you know, daisy shaped plants um, with um, uh, echinaceas, even though those are not native to our area, but um, they, they go together nicely. Um, the bottom left is little blue stem. Schiz, schizicarium, that's so hard to say, scoparium, and of course it's quite blue, um, shorter, um, beautiful plant. Um, bottom right is Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania sedge or Carex pennsylvanica. A lot of the sedges in general are quite drought tolerant. Um, and um, I've got some under a uh, heritage birch and I, I, once in a while I do have to water them, but they're pretty tough. I have a different kind, it's a blue zinger. But um, this is um, been used a lot for this kind of lawn look, this uh, swept grass look. Um, it doesn't look like a regular lawn. It's um, definitely um, more sort of windblown looking, but it's very nice and, and it will take some shade as well. Um, here are some perennials that are natives. These are U.S. natives, okay? These are not local New England necessarily natives. Um, but the Monarda up on the top left, um, I didn't do the Monarda fistulosa picture. That does, I think that is a New England native. But um, Bradburyana is more to the south and central. And it's, um, I think it's a little lighter pink. Um, does have a little little blue tone to it, a um, little bit different habit. Um, and um, blooms a little earlier and has a natural mildew resistance. Um, then um, at the top, the right Allium cernuum um, is native from Canada and Mexico. And I guess, you know, all the way down, I'm not sure exactly where. I've never, honestly, never seen it in our area, but it is a native um, and it may be native to New England. Um, I'd love to hear from somebody who's actually seen it, but um, I've grown this for years. I grew it in another um, uh, yard that I had and I grow it here. Um, many of the alliums in general are drought resistant. Um, it's pretty, it's called nodding onion, um, because, um, that's, that is the name of it, um, the, the common name because it nods. I mean, it's not, it's not doing that because it's dry and needs water. That's its habit. It's got a little nodding head, very pretty little plant and a late blooming allium as well. Um, Echinacea pallida, which is the low, um, bottom slide there. Um, this is also a U.S. native. Um, and these are prairie plants. Echinaceas are prairie plants, mid, mid part of the country. Um, but they do fine here, especially if they're um, species types. Um, some of those fancy cultivars are very finicky, I found. Um, but it's the, the um, petals do droop like that. That's its habit. And they're thinner. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, uh, the wavy line emerald moth, which is the most beautiful thing I've, I looked it up, is the most beautiful shade of green, um, feeds on the foliage of this plant. And so it's an important plant for pollinators. Um, 
And you might want to look up, I, I didn't want to, since I was doing this, I didn't want to start showing pictures of moths, but you might want to look it up. The color is absolutely gorgeous, a lot like a Luna moth. Um, shrubs that are native to the southeastern U.S., but of course are U.S. natives. Um, beautyberry, uh, Calicarpa americana. I, I know the first time I ever saw Calicarpa, I was like, I couldn't believe my eyes. Like, are you kidding? That color is real on those berries. Um, it looks like nothing to write home about. Any of the Calicarpas don't impress until the berries are fully developed. And then once the leaves fall off, which is into November usually, um, it's really cool. And um, it's great in, in, in bouquets for a little while. It doesn't, doesn't last that long, but anyway, just a gorgeous plant. Um, and I, I've grown that since the day I found out it existed. Um, Itea virginica, which is also a fragrant plant. This is it in its fall color. It does get white uh, blossoms. Um, and you can still, if you look close, you can kind of see where they were um, on this, um, this is like right here, you can see some of the spent blossoms, um, but the fall color is just really great. And it's a great stand-in for um, burning bush, which you know is no longer sold for years it hasn't been because it's invasive. And if you have it on your property, I plead with you to get it get it out. Um, it's shown up in all kinds of places. Uh, way too happy to recede. Um, here's the hydrangea cursifolia, or the oak leaf hydrangea. I think this is a great plant. Um, I have it in my yard. Um, the top is it in flower, and the bottom is the fall foliage, which is stunning. Um, it's great to have plants that do double duty, you know, or even sometimes triple duty. In this case, flowers and great foliage. Um, and um, I just think it's a wonder, a wonderful plant. Um, let's start talking about non-native plants now. And the reason I told Laurie, she, the whole thing was supposed to be just native plants. And I said, hey, you know, um, a lot of people want to know about what will do well in their gardens that that isn't native. Um, so I'm 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 guessing that you would, and um, so because that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this. Um, and um, you know, it's important to have native plants. There's no question about it. I'm a big proponent. I'm all kinds of groups that um, do things with with native plants. Um, and I've been working with them for years. Um, but um, we're gonna talk about some non-natives that can withstand some drought conditions. And a lot of it is from my own observation. Um, but of course I did do some research here. Um, and I chose these two because I just think they're cool plants. Uh, there's many more I'm sure. Uh, the seven suns tree, Heptacodium myconoides, is drought insult tolerant. That is, I'm sorry, the one on the right, I should have put that in there. Um, those are the blossoms. The um, bark is beautiful on it too. And um, if it's pruned correctly, it is just stunning. You need to prune to open things up a little bit. Um, so just a wonderful, wonderful plant. And it's, uh, did I say it's drought insult tolerant, yep. And then on the left is the ginkgo biloba, the maiden hair tree. And this is it in the fall because it's just, it turns absolutely yellow golden. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful tree. They can get quite, quite tall. Um, and what you want it, and I don't know how you do it. I don't think there's really a way to guarantee that you don't get a female. If you get a female, the fruit is incredibly foul smelling okay i don't want to discourage you from having one um but but it is um but it doesn't last forever and i just don't think to the best of my knowledge unless somebody wants to correct me that there's any way of telling um the difference when they're when they're young before they get the fruit um 
It is one of the oldest living tree species in the world. And um, it dates back to before the dinosaurs. And um, that also makes it a pretty cool plant. Gorgeous shaped leaves, um, iconically beautiful shaped leaves. Um, here's a couple of others that also can deal with drought quite well. Um, the Japanese pagoda tree, Sephora japonica, it was hard for me to find a really great picture of this. Um, they do get these yellow kind of dangly blossoms and um, apparently there's some up in the um, public gardens or the common, someone told me. Um, so just a great, great tree that's seldom used. Um, uh, the bottom, that, that would be the top left one. The bottom left is the bald cypress, um, Taxodium disticum. And um, uh, who told me about this? Oh, it was Abraham Monahan, who works for Bartlett. And um, it was great to see something that's, you know, got some evergreen to it. Um, and so the top and bottom are, cra are crab apple uh, species. This is um, Malus is the is the species is the um, genus name for um, crab app for apple. Um, this is prairie fire. Um, it's got a gorgeous color in the spring. I mean, all crab apples are beautiful, but look at that color. And then it's got an amazing abundance of beautiful red fruits. Um, I'm sure you've seen these and probably they've caught your eye. It's a very good one for both um, blossom and for uh, fruit. Um, shrubs. Oh, there were there were tons I could have chosen, but I tried to give some variety here. Um, the nine bark or Physocarpus opulifolius. This one is summer wine, which doesn't get too tall. Um, there are others that get um, have different kinds of foliage. There's like a one that's kind of coppery and rusty, which is relatively new. There there are ones that are very dark. There are ones with chartreuse foliage, um, but a, a tough Tough plant. There is a native um, nine bark um, as well. Um, I don't know if they're native to this area. I've never seen one, um, but to the U.S. they are. Um, and then on the top right is a relatively new cultivar of Adutsia. It's must have been bred from Nico, which is a low shrubby one, and Nico is white. I have that here. Um, and this one is Yuki Cherry Blossom, gorgeous color. Um, you know, if you're into pink, um, you know, this, this is the one for you. Very, very pretty. Um, bottom left, um, we all know the iconic lilac. Um, I couldn't really, I don't think I could survive without lilac in my life. Uh, I think the scent is just incredibly romantic and beautiful. There are many different uh, types. Um, there are many different colors ranging from white to pinks to um, deep, deep purples to ones that are purple in white. And I could go on and on and on. Um, there are other, there are other shorter shrubbier types like the Palata and Miss Kim as well. Um, on the right bottom is Canomalies um, speciosa. It's a flowering quince. Uh, they're very old fashioned. Um, they come around the same time as the Forsythia. In fact, I remember a place in Kingston where they had them growing right next to each other. Uh, but there are some beautiful colors. I thought this particular one, this sort of corally hot pink was just gorgeous. So again, that's an early, early bloomer, um, gorgeous plant. Uh, here's one I think a lot of people don't know about. Uh, it's not easy to find around here. Um, many years ago, when I was first at Kennedy's, I had asked them why they didn't carry it. And they said, it blooms so darn early, nobody's looking for anything <laughs> at that time of year. Um, so anyway, I've had mine for years. I have no idea where I got it. Um, but it's called Korean forsythia, but it's not a forsythia. It's Abeliophyllum disticum, and it's white with just a hint of like 
a whisper of pink to it. Um, it can get a little rangy. You've got to prune it right after it blooms. Um, sometimes that's the case. You can't wait at all or it won't bloom again next year. Um, so, and it can be severely pruned. Um, I have it toward the back. A lot of things that bloom this spring, I have toward the back of my beds because, you know, and it just makes sense. They're done. Okay, let the next thing bloom. Um, I'm sure many of you must know about Caryopteris, I'll call, also called Bluebeard. Um, Here's a three different kinds, um, uh, and there's a few, several different um, uh, cultivars. The top one is sunshine blue, and so there's chartreuse foliage with the blue, with the blue blossoms. Um, this plant blooms very late. It it um, it's you know a late August into early September plant uh, when we're looking for things to be blooming. It's a shrub, but in many ways you treat it like a perennial because you, the best way to deal with the pruning is to prune it early in the season when you're doing things uh, like your roses, like, you know, April, you know, mid-April or so. Um, and so then there's white surprise, there's other types of variegated white ones too, which I have at a couple of places. And then sterling silver where the foliage is um, extremely silvery colored. So just a great plant, um, very underused, I think. Um, I realized last year that roses, once established, are pretty darn drought tolerant. Um, so that's why I've talked talking about them here. But at the top is a, and I could not find the name of this one. I think it's gorgeous. Um, this is an herbaceous peony. The flower of an herbaceous peony, um, herbaceous meaning the type that um, come up and the stem is soft and you can cut them back late in the fall when they, you know, as opposed to the bottom left, where is a tree peony that you do not prune, um, you know, you'll, you'll ruin it. Um, and those are good too. I, I have probably about 10 of those in my yard um, of various colors. And um, the only problem that I've ever come, that I think there is with a tree peony is that the blossoms don't last very long. Um, they're great, and same with regular peonies, you know, to site them somewhere you don't have a lot of wind because um, you want to enjoy those blossoms. But some of the blossoms on tree peonies are just breathtaking. So that's why I recommend them. This is Shiman Nishiki. Um, Pop right, uh, Lichnus coronaria, angel's blush. I'm positive you've all seen the um, magenta one, um, which doesn't work for me as a color in my garden, but to each his own. Um, it, that one is a prolific self-seeder. This one will self-sow. It's a good kind of knitter plant in between um, other larger blossom perennials. Um, and it's got silver foliage. This isn't the most gorgeous picture of it, but, um, and then down on the right, this one happens to be a climber that I am completely in love with. Um, not that easy to get, but if you can do it, but I found all the roses to be quite drought tolerant. If, you know, they're established and you still have to watch it. Um, this is peachy pink. It's a double, huge double flower. It's a climber and it's fragrant. I mean, I don't know why it's not more available. It's got everything going for it. My next door neighbor has been propagating them, but I'm not going to tell you who she is. So anyway, okay. At the top, silver leaved plants in general tend to, you know, deal with drought quite well. They're from the Mediterranean usually. Um, and, you know, they just can thrive in that um, hot, you know, doesn't have to even be great soil. Um, they actually, a lot of those plants don't like a really rich soil. Um, the top left, of course, is lavender. The 
um, English ones, the angustifolias, um, are usually a safe bet um, for keeping over the winter. Um, there are others, but um, the big thing, I mean, I've had so many people lose lavender. It's happened to me too. Um, even in what I think is a great spot, they don't want to be wet over the winter. They just don't want to be. And they don't want a lot of um, compost and, and, and mulch and so forth. Um, super fragrant, long lasting. Um, I actually use lavender um, buds in some of my baking and I make a lavender lemonade and you know, I think a lot of you who know me know I'm an herby person. Up on the top is um, the Stakey's Byzantina, the Helene von Stein, which has a bigger leaf. It basically does not flower. So there's no distracting flower on this. Um, it's also called big ear sometimes. Occasionally it will send up a flower. Um, the, the plain old fashioned one, um, Liam's ears, the smaller leaves does get a flower, but um, I, I'm, you know, a lot of people, I, they've read this because a lot of people don't really think the flower is all that great. So um, great front of the border plant. Um, down on the bottom left is um, Russian sage. We used to know it as Perovskia atriplicifolia. Um, it is no longer in that category. Um, it is a salvia. You know, they called it Russian sage. And then they found out, oh my gosh, you know what? It really is a salvia, salvia yangii. And um, there's a bunch of different um, cultivars of this, you know, that more upright, smaller, whatever. Um, so you can usually get one that will suit the situation. Um, bottom right is sea holly. And I've always been just kind of fascinated by this plant. Um, even the name sea holly, you know, Eryngium giganteum silver ghost happens to be this one. It's, um, I think it's related to Miss Wilmot's ghost. There are many others though that are much more blue. I just love the photo of this one. So um, again, really does not want, um, it can get floppy if you give it too much water, too much great soil. So um, again, a lot of these silver plants thrive in um, sort of benign neglect. Um, I've always loved this combination. Um, this is, um, these are also drought taunt, a um, little bit of a fuzzy picture, but um, you can see the Perovskia on the right part of the curve. Then it works into, I think there's some nepeta in there um, or, you know, catmint. And then the um, terracotta yarrow, um, which is that kind of orangey gold one. And then toward the very front is, you can see two different salvias. The darker one is caradonna, which is um, one that I really, really, really like. Um, it's a little bit taller than the, the plain nemorosas. Um, uh, it's got like a burgundy stem. You keep these deadheaded and they will bloom pretty much all season for you. Um, so I just think that's a great uh, uh, color combination. The contrast is really nice. And you know, you could do it with pink ones. You could take out the gold orange and put in pink or any other color you want. Um, I had to include Dianthus, um, which is on the top, with mixed in with some Shasta daisies, which um, are somewhat drought tolerant too. Um, but the 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 Dianthus, um, people know them as carnations, um, or, or you know clove pinks, um, very old fashioned plant shows up on a lot of the um, uh, illuminations and uh, things from the um, you know, medieval times. Um, Gilly flower is another old fashioned name for it. Inchmary has been around since like the 1500s. I grow this one. So fragrant. Um, really likes it hot and dry. I've got an upper part in front of my house that's 
bakes and there's stone up there and great drainage. And that's where I keep them. They can otherwise, I think, sometimes be difficult. But if you get the right place, there's they're fabulous plant. Um, bottom, this is a cultivar of um, Baptisia. Um, this one's Blue Sunday. It's got a very blue blossom to it. Um, they are also native Baptisias. And with the cultivars, they have some amazing colors. Um, you know, you can get them to um, in, you know, these bicolor ones and smoky purples and yellows. And there's even a white one, which I found somewhere was a native. They're very hard to get, the true white ones. Um, so, okay, here's just a cool picture of a garden, okay? And I chose it because I was looking for some that had, um, uh, what is the name of that plant? Sorry, blanking out here. Oh, verbascums. Okay. Um, so those are the, these here. And then there's sort of these peachy, like peachy pink ones. Um, and they like it dry too. Um, uh, I grow them again up in that hot area. They do great. And some of mine will... Um, self so it's not prolific by any means but every once in a while it's like oh look at another one um in the whoops sorry in the middle here are um jeez i don't know why it keeps doing that i'm very sorry if i touch my mouse it does that so the top purple ones in the middle are opium poppies papaver somniferum and um those will reseed nicely for you um uh, you can save the seed or you can just let them drop. And then there is salvia, some salvias. These are annual salvias. And salvias, by and large, are very drought tolerant. Um, and then there's some scabiosas down here, also drought tolerant. Just, I mean, those colors, that, that just, you know, that's me right there. Some of those I don't think are drought tolerant. I don't know what, they're just making a pretty pictures, but I wanted to show you those. Okay, here's some ground covers for sun. And the top left is um, called leadwort, not a pretty name, but try to say Ceratostigma plumbaginoides. Um, and I'll you know, give you a, a, a sticker on your forehead. Um, this is a great plant. Um, grows in part shade. It grows in um, sun. Um, it's really a not fussy plant. Comes up late because it blooms late, so it's good to know where it is. Um, I have it in a couple of different situations in my yard, and it does great. Um, and then in September, even even later, you start to get these absolutely you know sapphire cobalt blue flowers. Um, doesn't get too tall, um, but it's not a flat ground cover either. Um, great little weaver plant. And um, uh, then the foliage turns red, which is a bonus. Uh, down on the bottom, I'm sorry, top right is a sedum. And I, I figured you'd all be waiting for me to talk about sedums because they do take it dry. Um, they're, um, this one is one I've always liked called Coca-Cola Lytikensi. And it's got these sort of raspberry blooms and a very blue foliage. It's another one called... I think it's blueberry muffin or something like that. Um, very, very blue foliage. Um, Kennedy's usually has those. Um, bottom is a yarrow that grows very, very low, very blue foliage, and it's Achillea tomentosa. And that tomentosa is where it's like, you know, got that little fuzziness on it. And down on the bottom right is snow in summer, uh, Cerastium tomentosum. And again, you got that word tomentosa. Um, this is an old fashioned plant. Um, it does, once it finishes blooming, it should be sheared back and you get a new growth of just nice silver foliage for the rest of the season. But it's very pretty, uh, very pretty plant. Right at the top of a wall. And again, because it's silver leaved, like this yarrow here, it's um, pretty tough and drought tolerant. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do this without doing herbs. Um, uh, 
some of you know I've been the Herb Society for, I don't know, 150 years or so. Um, so the top one is Creeping Time. I didn't know what kind it was. It wouldn't really matter, um, but you would have to keep this clipped. I mean, but how fun is that checkerboard, huh? Um, and it can be walked on. This is one of those true steppables. Um, when it's the low kind like that, you really can walk on it and release the scent. Um, the top right, <clears throat> it's not a great picture, but I, I had to I had to promote this a little bit. Down at the um, Heritage Museum and uh, Gardens is an herb garden. I helped redo this garden and I wish they had a better picture, but I couldn't find one. Um, oh my God, it's been well over 10 years, I'm sure now. Um, but it's, you know, it's all seashell, crushed cl clam shells. And um, it's a great place to visit in general. But, um, and unfortunately, they don't keep it the way I had intended it to be kept. But still, um, you know, hot, and you get that reflecting of the, um, of the seashell, making it very warm. Uh, I know there's lots of times and different plants in there. Um, he, right here is a, and this is also pretty drought tolerant. Oh, darn. Um, that is a um, agastache, and um, those are pretty tough. There is a there is a native one as well, and then even those fancy ones um, that um, you know have the orange and 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 red um, foliage that are not quite so hardy are also very drought tolerant and good pollinator plants. Bottom left is <clears throat> clary sage, uh, salvia scleria. It's a biennial and usually you can keep it going because it will reseed. It's a stunning plant. Those are actually bracts, not flowers. Um, when plants have a bract, there is a flower, but it's inside, very tiny. Um, wonderful plant. Um, it's got some presence. Um, again, the lavender. Um, just had to pop that in there because it's such a well-known herb. Um, <clears throat> so here we are at succulents because those, you know, you definitely think, okay, those will take dry. They don't need a lot of water. And that's true. Um, sedum angelina, um, it's everywhere. It looks particularly great with a blue-leaved sedum. Um, and um, if it's happy, it'll really take off. Uh, and it can be right, you know, growing right into like, a, um, you know, crevices. Um, you can see it here doing that. Um, on the top right, I love this plant. I, I When I first saw it, I was like, okay, I got to have that. That's too cute. And that is great in crevices around stone and stepping stones where it's hot. You really can't step on this. You can't step on sedums, okay? But it can grow, weave through. Um, called Dunce's cat for an obvious reason. Uh, it's got gray, 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 light gray foliage. Um, just a fun little plant. Um, sedums, um, you know, you've got the, um, um, what's that one that everybody has, you know? Um, Autumn Joy. Um, that was kind of the first big, big one that everybody uh, fell for. And for good reason, they're a great plant. But there are other types that are similar in um, size um, that are, you know, green and yellow variegated, um, different color flower. This one is frosty more. It gets a white flower. Um, the only thing with a lot of variegated plants is that sometimes they start to um, revert and you've got to pitch out the part that's reverting. It'll want to go back to just plain green, but it's a pretty one. Um, and then hens and chicks, Semper vivum tectorum. And there's a lot of different ones uh, of those um, different colors. Some are, you know, there's the cobweb one. There's some um, green ones. There's some that are more blue, um, some with gold in them, um, you know, fun plants. Um, also called house leeks. Um, there was an old story about they used to put them up on their roof. I think that's why they were called house leeks to keep the lightning from hitting their house. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Is this one being just... Okay, these are ornamental grasses, um, and there's many more. These will also take a lot of dryness, and um, they, I think grasses are great if they're used properly. And I see kind of, you know, everybody's got that, I've got to have a big grass in my yard, and it doesn't always look right to me. Um, but um, I'm not here to to um, be the taste police on the gardens, I guess. Um, anyway, they um, the dwarf fountain grass, Hamlin, and it is spelled like that. I kept wanting to call it Hameln, which was so hard to say. And somebody said, no, it's Hamlin. Um, and it's a fountain grass. There's a bunch of different ones. There's little bunny and um, redhead. and um, But again, they're lower ones. Uh, nice plumes. Uh, the main grass is that one, you know, that Viscanthus sinensis chrysalimus is the one that a lot of people um, just have to have that big tall grass. Um, and it's beautiful. And it's some of them are great in dried arrangements. Um, down on the bottom left is north wind panicum or switchgrass, very kind of upright. Um, and probably one of my favorites down on the bottom is blue fescue. Um, very, very blue, uh, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Um, then we're going to go into shade now. Um, the top one is, I, God, I saw this picture. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to just put one hellebore picture. I'm going to do this whole thing. Can you imagine having this whole thing be hellebores? I don't know what they do later. Nothing, I guess. Won't be any room. But Orientalis is the kind that we think of um, for hellebores. There are other kinds. Um, and um, I've got Fetidus, which has a green blossom, and all of them are green. Um, and I also have Helleborus niger, which is the Christmas um, hellebore, a Christmas rose, they call it. And it's not a rose, of course, blooming very early. Um, all of them are drought tolerant. Um, the bottom, I wanted to show you a pretty combination here on the left, which is um, um, an epimedium, great leaves with a hellebore. And the contrast of the two colors, I think is very pretty. Uh, I have a little bit of a penchant for that dark sort of aubergine color. Um, and then um, this is epimedium cherry blossom. And there are so many epimediums, honestly. And predominantly they are great in dry shade. Um, it's one you can put pretty close to a maple tree. Um, more dry shade perennials. Um, Heuchera up on the top there. Um, there's many different kinds, also called coral bells, but some of them don't actually get coral bells. They get white ones or soft pink ones. So I like to call them heucheras. Um, for that reason, unless they have coral flowers. Um, and that's a ghost fern, which is related to um, Japanese painted fern. And those will all take surprising amount for a fern, surprising amount of dryness. Um, pastas on the right. Pastas are literally one of those things you can plant at the base of a maple tree. And is you know, as long as it's... Um, gotten its roots down there, it'll probably be fine. Um, nice contrast with the gold hosta next to it, or any gold plant, but I didn't know what the name of that one was. Um, foxglove <clears throat> will take quite a bit of dryness too. Um, I think most people assume it won't, but it does. This kind is a biennial. There are perennial types. I think the color on this one, the Sutton's apricot, is gorgeous. And, um, you know, hopefully they'll sell so, um, and you can buy them. Um, there's also one called, oh man, there's one that there's at Kennedy's, I can't think of the name of it, that is also around that color um, that I've bought there. It's um, escaping me. Um, Renera macrophylla, this is sea heart. There's also Jack Frost. It's a, what they call a perennial forget-me-not because of the flowers also takes dry and looks great all season, whether it's in bloom or not because of the variegation. 
Um, I'm sorry for the fuzziness, but to make it big enough, it lost some of its um, fine tune. But this is all predominantly hosta and lamium. Um, lamium, um, it's also called dead nettle, which is a terrible plant. But all of the, I, thought, I just love the colors in this. All of the lamiums are, are quite drought tolerant. Um, it's a definitely a front of the border kind of ground cover kind of plant. Um, just don't get the yellow one. I think it's called Herman's Pride. Um, maybe I'm, I can't remember the whole full name of that one. But anyway, don't get that yellow one. It's invasive. Um, so, and you can see how dry it is. Look at the lawn. It's kind of dry there. So, and the plants are doing just great. Um, a couple of drought um, our garden photos. The top um, is almost like a rock garden kind of feel to it. Um, and um, that grass there, I'm trying to remember what that one is, but I think there's Baptisia. I think there is um, variegated iris in there um, in the middle of the picture. And then the weeping um, uh, cedrus. Um, uh, the Cedrus Atlantica Glocka Pendula. It's a lot of words to explain this tree, but it's a weeping um, uh, Atlantic cedar. And I'm sure you've seen them. They're very dramatic. Um, and then it looks like time way over on the right. Um, I don't remember what that grass is. It's not, it's not a Hakoni grass. Uh, but anyway. Um, so you, you, you get, get my drift here. I think there's a lot of time in there. The bottom one, um, maybe a little more sort of English garden feel to it. Um, but it's roses, nepeta, which is catmint and stakies, um, the lamb's ear with the blossoms on it. Um, so just a very pretty, um, cool, relaxing, uh, lovely picture. Um, I want to talk about gravel gardens just really quick. It's it's um a thing. Um, guy named David Culp, who has a book called The Well Layered Garden, and I've seen several of his um uh, Zoom presentations, and I've seen him in person. He's got his driveway as gravel, and things started to seed in it, and he liked it, and um, so he's kind of you know let it go and added to it, and said one day a friend of his had driven up and thought, oh, geez, Dave would probably love it if I weeded this driveway. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, but Beth Chatto, who is a, mm, she's passed away now, very famous English gardener, very famous. And this is hers on the left. And those spiky orange things are, um, I think they're eremorous, um, which is foxtail lily. But another plant that's similar, those are not that easy to grow. Um, you can do it, but there's also Nifofia or red hot poker, which could you know, be similar color. There's sea holly in there, there's sedum, um, some grasses. Um, and then in the middle, um, I think it's salvias in the back, the purples. And then that is Armeria maritima or thrift. Um, also a great uh, seaside plant. But again, you can see it dry. Um, and then this sort of homespun look, looking one. And I believe that white plant growing out of the gravel is, um, I think it's Jupiter's beard, Centranthus, but it's the white uh, form. Uh, the I have gravel in my backyard. That's one of the reasons it's been interesting to me. And things pop out of the beds and growing the gravel beautifully. Um, you have to have soil underneath it and then a fine gravel of about four to five inches, as long as the roots can get down to that soil. But um, it it does help with um, not having to water. Um, so I just, for those of you interested in trying something like that, um, lawn alternatives, and, and I am wrapping this up soon. Um, I have a couple of patches of clover in my backyard that are just wonderful. They're great. It's a great pollinator plant. It seems to never die. Um, I wouldn't mind having my whole lawn be clover. Um, 
And then in the bottom, these are, you know, pathways. You didn't have to have grass there. Um, I think what that little blue plant is. Um, uh, Josh, I'm sorry. Um, but you can see on the right, sort of like a patio area where they've got all these um, little creeping plants and sedums and different things uh, growing. And in crevices between the stones, I think is just beautiful. Um, so, sorry, I can't remember all my plants all the time. Um, if you put in tiny light blue ground cover, it would come up. Uh, bearded iris um, is a great um, drought tolerant plant. This one is called black water. Again, there's that color that I don't want my whole garden that color, but I do like it. Um, it gives some depth in the garden, some mystery. Uh, daylilies, honestly, you could grow a daylily in a cup of coffee, I think. Um, I've, heard, I've heard people that have been inundated with salt water that their daylilies came back. So, um, and, and you don't have to have the plain old, um, you know, tawny daylilies that you see on the side of the road. Um, there are so many gorgeous, gorgeous colors these days. Um, Tranquil Lake down in Rehoboth is a great place to go. Um, alliums, uh, as I said before, quite drought tolerant. This one is called Millennium, and a friend of mine in um, Rock Garden Society is the guy that actually uh, bred this plant. And then the species tulips um, are very good in drought, and they will come back every year, unlike the fancy, um, you know, hybridized tulips. These are short. Um, they come in different colors. Um, this is one that I grow. Um, so, and there, there are other things, you know, there are other bulbs too. So I think in general, most bulbs are pretty tough, the spring ones, because they go dormant and then they're under there and they're not exposed. So I think in general, they're pretty drought tolerant. Um, so here is my um, suggested books and websites, um, some bunch of books, uh, Blue Stem Natives, of course, is on there. Uh, Kennedy's, of course, is on there. High Country Gardens and Digging Dog are places that are out west, um, and um, they have some great plants. I'm a big fan of Digging Dog. Um, they have things that also grow here because they're in Northern California. And then I want to thank Abraham Monningham of Bartlett Tree, um, who's my buddy. And uh, he did tell me about a couple of the drought tolerant trees. So that's it. <clears throat> I hope I've been somewhat entertaining and okay. um, that you've we've learned got, something. Thank we've you got so a bunch much. Of, we've got a bunch of questions for you. Okay, great. Uh, the first one is, can you pick up native plants at a greenhouse or in seeds? Yes. Yes to both. Um, uh, at, a, at a nursery, um, they probably won't be, the native plants won't be in the greenhouse. They'll be outside. Um, um, I worked at Kennedy's for eight years. We carried quite a few native plants. Um, but the place that specializes in them, and they specialize in New England and local native plants is blue stem natives over in Norwell. So it's, I, you know, I mean, I love Kennedy's and if you want all kinds of other things, they're great. Um, but um, blue stem is the place for to buy natives. Seeds, yes, I, you can. Um, uh, some things will re-sow, you know, self-sow themselves. Um, you know, there's there's more work to to doing things from seed. So, and I know that blue stem is also carrying seeds now too. Yes, I believe they are. Yeah, thanks. Okay. The next question is: Could you comment on deer tolerant favorites? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, only because I didn't focus on that. Um, that's a whole other um talk, and I'm not trying to. Well, I guess I am trying to side a lot of it. Um. There are lists, and I will tell you that Kennedy's has a great list. Um, I think it's the one we used to use actually was the Rutgers. I think it was, you know, the, the Rutgers College or University up in what, New Jersey or something. They have a very good list. I would go online. Um, uh, 
you know, I, I don't have that problem here. I, I do know that supposedly they don't like things that are scented, like they won't eat lavender, you know. Um, but um, I also thought they wouldn't eat alliums and I had very special, um, hard to come by yellow allium with very blue foliage at a client's house. Actually, the bunnies ate that, but you know, if the bunnies ate it, I mean, we got bunny problems too, right? So right. Um, I'm, I, I don't mean to, to you know, um, I don't have deer in my yard because I'm very enclosed, but I do have bunnies and I can't believe how many things they will eat. What I do recommend is um, that um, company, oh God, they do, I forget what, oh deer. Um, I've heard good things about them. Um, they come and spray something that's, you know, non-toxic and organic. And that's supposed to work. Um, certainly fencing in your whole yard with like, you know, 40 feet fences or something would help. Um, I'm exaggerating, of course, but, um, you know, it's it's tough. Um, I, I feel bad for people that have deer. Um, and the other question was, how do we keep the bunnies from eating forsythia? But you kind of addressed that as well. From eating forsythia? Yeah. Jeez. Um, this always seems to me there's so much forsythia. There should be plenty for us and the rabbits. I don't grow forsythia. Um, but what I use in my yard um, is um, plant skid. Um, P L A N T. S-K-Y-D-D -D or something like that. It's a strange word. I think it's Swedish or something. Um, it smells horrible if you use the spray, um, but you can buy it in um, granules as well, which is what I tend to use. Um, so um, that's what I use for here for bunnies. Okay. The next um, question. I'll also just tell you, I... If, if you're getting things eating your bulbs, um, the actual bulbs, because a couple of years ago, all my species tulips were on the ground and I thought a bunny had done it. Then I realized, no, they're not, they would have eaten it and they weren't eaten. And I looked closely and the bulbs were pulled up and eaten. And that must've been chipmunks or squirrels. And so I learned that now when I plant bulbs, I use, hot red pepper flakes when I plant them right in the hole. And it has helped. There's another little tidbit. So okay. the next question is we had a fungus problem on crab apple leaves and we were told it was cedar rust. We only had one small cedar, so we removed it. Things seemed better. Is this coincidental or was cedar likely the cause? I don't know much about that disease. I'm, I'm familiar with, with it. Um, I would call a tree person if it, if anything comes back. I have um I have a an old fashioned big old 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 crab apple in my yard, and it was fine up until a couple of years ago, and then it started to get rust, not cedar rust, and um something else I forget. Um and um so it's got to be treated like um every year I guess. Um, that would, that would that probably is, be a good question for Bartlett tree experts, and they'll be at our uh, live expo on Saturday. Okay. Uh, the next one is a comment. Uh, he said, lavender loves reflected heat from walls or stones. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know people that um, have said that putting... Um, shells around around lavender will help too and again that's that reflective heat and um um mine is is always got stone around it a lot of plants that are touchy you know or iffy or even a little out of your zone um can benefit from, from that situation okay the next question is with gravel gardens is there a specific soil under the gravel not that I'm aware of. I just have plain old soil and I, I've not read anything saying that as I, you know, I put some books um, on these gravel gardens, which I admit I haven't read. Um, 
Um, I'm just beginning to understand gravel gardens and I've only touched the tip of the iceberg. I'm not an expert on them. I'm not sure how much expertise you really need, um, but um, I would suggest that you maybe take a couple of those out of the library and or, or do some reading online. But mine just, mine just grows. I do know that you need soil underneath. You know, you need something. And I do know that um, it's four or five inches of gravel on top, which is about what I have out there anyway. Okay, next question is, what about creeping phlox? Um, yeah, um, I'm just, I'm not a fan of, of the subulata myself, so I didn't put it in there. Yeah, it's, it's drug tolerant. Yeah. All right. The next comment is just, this has been very fun to watch and learn. Oh, thank you. Uh, the next one is, would you have any ideas about where to find American chestnut trees, non-genetically modified varieties? That again might be a question for Bartlett. That might be, um, you know, I mean, you can go online. Um, there's there's a place called Trees of Antiquity, but I think that I think that's um, um, probably more than you'd need. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would ask um, Abraham or somebody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. And he, he'll be there on Saturday at the live expo. So he, he could probably answer that question. Great. Um, the next comment is plant clover. Rabbits will eat it before your flowers. Exactly. And I meant to mention that because <laughs> that's exactly the one of my big points about it is that he's always out there. They, they, he, whatever. Um, and I'll, and as they, they go, if they start eating something else, I'm like, hey guys back over here, you know, but they will, they will eat that before they will go to your plants. It's their preferred food, I guess. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Somebody just gave me a um, link for Cedar Rust and I just put it into the chat. The next question is, oh, it's a comment. Uh, for deer, my parents shaved Irish spring or red pepper around the gardens. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, somebody else gave us a link for, and I'll put it in the chat, for uh, gravel gardens. So I just put that in the chat. Um, the next one is, I hear that walnut trees can have adverse effects on some plants. Do you know which ones? And then they said, thank you. Great talk. You know, I'll, I'll pretty much everything. They're, I think it's called allopathic or something like that. I never got the word right. But um, that's when a plant gives off a toxin that makes it impossible for things to grow under it. Um, uh, you, you could look that up online. It seems to me I've come across you know, one or two things that supposedly will grow under it, but um, off the top of my head, just about nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we had a walnut tree in our yard and there wasn't hardly yeah. anything that would grow on it, but it's a beautiful tree. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Someone says, I've seen some thriving American chestnuts in Marshfield. And then someone said, try the American Chestnut Foundation for there chestnut trees. And then the last one is just a comment. You've given us some wonderful ideas. Thank you. You're very welcome. So um, I'd like to encourage everybody to come to tomorrow night's talk. It's the Ecosystem Native Plant Support. And it's by Blake Dinius, the Plymouth County Entomologist. And I'd also like to encourage you to join us on Saturday for our first live expo in three years. Um, we're happy to be back at Kennedy's and it'll be from 10 to two. And like I said, Bartlett tree experts will have a whole lot of vendors and exhibitors there. Plus we'll have uh, speakers on the hour as well. Um, this year we'll also having a food vendor there and we're having a tool sharpening vendor as well. So I hope all of you will join us tomorrow night and I hope we'll see you at the expo on Saturday.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you everybody. Have a right. great night, great week. Good night. Bye.